So the outline of my presentation today is relatively simple. I'll spend the first half of my presentation uh, telling you the history of uh, the Spectrum Röntgen Gamma mission and the Rosita telescope, the scientific uh, drivers for the design of the telescope and of the mission, some technical characteristic and mission profile uh, uh, of the mission. And then uh, in the second part, I will tell you where we stand now, what has happened since launch, uh, some little problems we have had, and uh, but in fact, mostly the nice early results that we are gathering, uh, both from our early performance verification observation and from the Old Sky Survey. So as I will try to explain today, Erosita has been designed and has been operated as a survey instrument. And, um, um, sorry. So as a sur surveys do many things for astronomers. Of course, they allow you to gather huge volumes of data that you can use creatively to figure out uh, hidden correlations and study populations. But one of the most fundamental things that surveys do, they create maps that tell us where we are in the universe, give us an idea of our place in our local neighborhood. This is one example of an influential, very simple plot that was done in the in the 90s, one of the earliest redshift surveys, so this is a CFA redshift survey that was one of the first to reveal the filamentary uh, structure of galaxies in the nearby universe. And uh, I'm now moving to a more mod, a more recent nearby galaxy uh, survey. This is the Tumas redshift survey. And in this case, the, the you know, these are now galaxies in both hemispheres. It's an all sky uh, redshift survey, and you uh, here galaxies are color coded by their recession velocity. And this is important because allow you to give not only the uh, spatial density of galaxy, but also their velocity structure. So you can reconstruct, you can in, in, uh, introduce this data in a simulation in a computer, and you can simulate the large scale structure of the universe using the galaxy velocities and positions as initial conditions. And so people have done this so-called constraint simulation. This is an hydro simulation. Uh, this one created by Klaus Dolag at LMU. And because you have your computer local uh, density structure, you can turn on, for example, your, your X-ray eyes. And this is a computer view of how the local large scale structure would look like in X-rays. And you can clearly see that, of course, as we know, the knots and, uh, and the filaments uh, where most of the mass and the baryons concentrate because they turn very hot due to large virial shocks, they shine bright in X-rays. And so if you want, the motive, one of the motivations for building Erosita was to turn this computer vision, this computer picture into reality. Of course, it's not sufficient motivation for a funding agency. Another one is also that when you do this and you are able to look at these uh, knots in the large scale structure to larger distances, then you uh, have a new tool to study cosmology. This is, uh, you know, you see here on the left, a simulation of a patch of the X-ray sky. We know since many years of X-ray astronomy that when you look at the blank extragalactic sky, most of what you see are growing black holes, quasars and active galactic nuclei, and as extended sources, the clusters of galaxy, the most massive structure in the universe. And the plot in the top right from a very influential review by Rosati, Norman, and Borgani in 2002 just made clear in a very simple form that if you are able to count this very massive structure, if you're able to count clusters and plot their number density or even their cumulative number density as a function of redshift, you see how diverse, how different the prediction would be for different cosmological models because clusters live in the, in the tail of the uh, halo mass function. They are exponentially sensitive tracers of the underlying cosmological parameters. And this was recognized very early on and people have been doing cosmology using clusters of galaxy to study the growth of structures with small samples from X-ray select uh, 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 rosette clusters. And now this is turning into a proper industry using multi-wavelength uh, cluster search. So uh, clusters are uh, X-ray can provide nice alternative view to map the large scale structure and can uh, provide uh, cosmological constraints. So in the years after the discovery of the accelerated ex expansion of the universe, many papers were written to quantify how many clusters you would need to put uh, 
con uh, competitive constraint on cosmology. Uh, Hyman et al. 2005 wrote one of the most influential in which he uh, uh, quantified in of the order of 10 to the 5 clusters what you would need in order to achieve what is the so-called stage 4 cosmology experiment. So competitive with the uh, most advanced uh, um, CMB and other tracers for cosmology. So this was one of the main drivers for, for the Rosita project. And in order to detect 100,000 cluster, you can relatively simply calculate what the sensitivity is, given what we know about the number density evolution as a function of fluxes. And so you can design your telescope as uh, people did in 2006. Uh, PI at the time was Gunther Hasinger from MPE. They submitted a proposal to the German Space Agency in 2006. This was funded in 2007 to build a telescope that was sensitive enough to detect 100,000 clusters, essentially. And uh, this uh, was then consolidated by uh, interagency agreement between the German Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency, Roscosmos. And this was the birth of the current spectrum Röntgen Gamma of SRG mission. And in 2008, this mission consolidated into its current design with two telescopes. The Rosita is the primary one, and there is an additional hard X-ray telescope called Arctic C that I will show you in a minute. The mission was then designed for an L2 orbit, as the one you were seeing before the start of the talk. This, in fact, is the first uh, Russian mission in L2 ever. Of course, then on the Russian side, there is an even longer history of something called spectrum Röntgen gamma, an X-ray telescope was in the program of the Russian space agency, actually of the Soviet uh, space agency from the late 80s, as a broad international cooperation with uh, many countries, you can read here. And some pieces of hardware were actually built for the original Spectrum X, for example, the XRT uh, Swift uh, telescope. But then, unfortunately, the mission did not survive funding, funding crisis uh, in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it was only then into his new uh, incarnation uh, as SRG, revived in 2009 under the leadership of Rashid Sunyayev and Peter Predel as a bilateral, relatively unique uh, constellation of bilateral uh, uh, space mission and developed in Russia uh, in the interest of the Russian Academy of Science, represented by the Space Research Institute, IKI, in Moscow. And the spacecraft is designed by La Vochkin Association, so let me then focus on Erosita from the project management point of view. As I mentioned before, Peter Predell is the uh, principal investigator. I am a project scientist of the mission. And Erosita was developed by uh, a relatively small group of institutes in Germany uh, that received funding from our national uh, space agency and, uh, and additional funds by the Max Planck Society, of course, with broad industrial uh, cooperation and the number of associated scientific uh, uh, contributors from uh, Russia and Germany. Compared to uh, most other space missions of that size, uh, Erosita is peculiar, and I want to stress this, for the amount of uh, work that was done in, at MPE as a lead institute. Uh, MP not only had the project management of Erosita, but also we did most of the design of the instrument and we manufacture in our labs a large fraction of the parts of the telescope, both testing and flight uh, parts. We did the integration of the telescope in-house, we did all the testing in-house, and now we are doing parts of the operations, we are doing the data handling, the processing, and the archiving. So it's a huge, a huge investment of resources and manpower uh, for a single institute. So fast forward tracking, everything was built. It took about 12 years and a few years of delay. And then here we are on July 13, it's a very hot day in Baikonur, 40 degrees in the shade. Erosita and, S and uh, SRG spacecraft were in the fairing on top of this proton rocket. But okay, let me make a step back and describe you the hardware that we built. So this is actually a picture taken in Baikonur just a few days before the final integration of the rocket. What you see on this picture is the Erosita telescope, the bigger one uh, on the top. Uh, the Arctic Sea telescope uh, uh, manufactured by Iki is this 
uh, more slender, long uh, black tube, and they both uh, uh, are uh, resting on the navigator platform built by uh, Lavochkin. Here you see the folded in the folded solar panels, and now in this particular picture, the SRG and the payload, scientific payload, are connected to the block DM, which is the upper stage that brought the spacecraft into this L journey towards L2. So I showed you the Arctic Sea Telescope. Of course, my, my focus today will be focused on Erosita. Arctic Sea is a PI instrument and uh, led by Michael Pavlinski from ICI. And uh, um, uh, it is a hard X-ray telescope. It operates in the five to 30 kV range with a field of view of 34, 34 arc minutes and an axis resolution of less than about one arc minute. So if you want, it's a relatively large, but uh, it's a, sorry, a large uh, hard X-ray telescope, focusing telescope, there are not that many. In fact, the, its bigger brother is NUSTAR. Here you see a comparison of the effective area of the, the Arctic Sea Telescope in red compared to the NUSTAR in green. And, uh, and compared to the Erosita, that of course is much more sensitive, but operates at softer energy. So above about four or five kV, uh, Arctic Sea on SRG is the most sensitive telescope. But let me move to Erosita. Uh, these are pictures that maybe people have seen in the past. They were taken, I think now maybe four years ago, here at MP in the integration lab on the left, you see the seven mirrors. Uh, and they have a relatively short focal length of 1.6 meter, and they have been built with the same technology of mirror replica, lightweight mirror replica that XMM used. So it's really most part of the telescope inherited a lot of technological development that was done for XMM in Europe and in Germany. The, the main characteristic is this large field of view of one degree diameter. And uh, the telescope have the si similar uh, optical quality of the XMM ones. So we have half energy width on axis of about 18 arc second. In fact, it could be even better, but we on purpose try to optimize the uh, field of view average because this is what we, we need in scanning mode for the survey. And that is of the order 26 arc second. Um, this turns into uh, the plan. I mean, the original estimate was a source location accuracy of three to 10 arc second, depending on ability of attitude reconstruction. Now we know, and I will show you some plots, that in fact, we are much closer to the, to the best possible. Our uh, telescope stability delivered by the scaffold is really excellent to better than one arc second. And so we can locate our source now we know to maybe four arc second, four point source. So one, point, one important point of the telescope that you can uh, see on the left is that on top of the mirrors there, there are baffles that prevent more than 92% of stray light to uh, reach uh, the CCDs and this is very important to detect low surface brightness extended emission. The cameras are shown on the right here. You sh actually you see the box, the golden camera electronic box. The camera themselves are an evolution of the XMMPN uh, that very successfully have been flying for more than 20 years on XMM. And they have much, a number of improvement was done. We have a much lower sensitivity to temperature. The detector is much more uniform. There are no chip gaps. So the entire uh, the detector is exposed to the mirrors. And we have much better spectral resolution of about 80 EV at 1.4 kV. So altogether, this buys, I mean, you have to really to realize how big uh, Erosita telescope is. This is the effective area average over the field of view. For the combined seven Erosita mirror in red, you see that the at energy between half a kV and about two kV is as large as the combined XMM instruments, PN plus MOS. So it's effectively the largest, is as big as the largest X-ray telescope that has ever, is flying right now. And of course, that becomes even more, uh, the advantage with compared to XMM become even more if you calculate the GRASP or Entendu. This is the, the product of the effective area time, the field of view. It's a metric of how fast you can survey an, an area of the sky. And here, because of our much larger field of view, you see that Erosita is the, the fastest uh, survey tele X-ray telescope ever built. Um, and it's a factor of five to six uh, larger grasp than XMM-Newton. And more than a factor of 100 better 
than, than Chandra at 1 kV today, because of course we know that in Chandra the soft energy response has been degrading over the years. So the advantage is the large field of view, and this is what this picture is supposed to tell you again. But another advantage is the way we operate the telescope. We are operating the telescope in survey mode. Uh, I will show you some example, but one other unique characteristic of SRG is the ability to do the so-called raster scanning. So in this way, you can design field of view as large as 100, up to maybe 140 square degrees of different rectangular shapes and give you very uniform exposure over very, very large areas, much, much larger than any you know, point and stare, much, much larger and uniform than any point and stare survey you could dream to do with XMM. So this is now a nice animation video of the, our mission profile. As I told you, we are serving the sky into scanning mode, and this is what this video shows. This is uh, SRG with Erosita and Arctic C. The co covers are open, as they've been open since July. And uh, we rotate slowly, continuously, doing great circles in the sky. It takes about four hours to do one great circle. So in, in 24 hours, we scan uh, six times over the same position in the sky. And as the uh, L2 point around which we are orbiting, following the Earth moves around the sun, we move, we advance of about one degree per day. So after one day, six visits of, of a part of the sky, we leave that part of the sky and return to it after six months. Uh, and the idea is to do this. So in six months, you complete an old sky survey. And the idea is to do, the plan is to do this for four years uninterrupted. In this way, we will generate eight independent old sky surveys. And when you combine this, that we call ERAS for Erosita Old Sky Survey, one to eight, at the number eight, you reach, you can combine your data and you reach very high sensitivity. So this is the typical uh, figure of merit for surveys. For example, on the left, this shows the sensitivity to point sources. The x-axis is the area that you cover. On the y-axis, the limiting flux of sources you can detect, given our knowledge of background and instrument. And here you see the Rosa Old Sky Survey on the top right that covers the old sky to a few times 10 to minus 13 sensitivity. Already the first pass of Erosita is a factor of a few more sensitive than Rosa. And the expectation when we do ERAS 8 is to go down maybe a factor of 20, 30 more sensitive than Rosat. With on, on top of that, our unique spectral capabilities. So why we did that, as I told you, was to detect uh, 100,000 clusters. We think we are on a good route to that. One key element is uh, the ability to distinguish a cluster from a point source in the X-rays from the X-rays alone, without having to resort to additional uh, complication of multi-wavelength data that of course we will be looking at. But here this plot shows the uh, angular size in the sky of the R500, which is the ra ra radius of a cluster where the density within the cluster is 500 times the critical density of the universe. So these green curves shows the size of 10 to the 13 solar mass halos, 10 to the 13 solar mass halo, and 10 to the 15 solar mass halo as a function of redshift. And this red curve, it's one arc minute in the sky. I told you that our uh, alpha energy width is about 26 arc second, and we think we can resolve things to a uh, few, maybe 10, 15 arc seconds. So this gives you an indication of what we can resolve, okay? And so immediately this plot tells you that with our telescope, we can resolve a fraction of this R500 up to redshift one for a cluster more massive than a few times 10 to the 14. And our simulation tell us that actually our sensitivity has been designed to be uh, able to deliver about 100,000 clusters as expected. And in fact, the expectation is that we will detect all clusters that are more massive than two times 10 to the 14 solar masses that lies along our past light cone. And uh, why, I mean, th there are many discussion about how Import, how difficult it is to turn cluster astrophysics into cosmological tool. This is a, a nice exploration of what we can do in X-rays. That shows, as a function of the radius, the scatter in the thermodynamical quantities coming from the ESCOP survey done with XMM, led by Dominic Eckert. So it's a few clusters that have been studied in greater detail by, by XMM. And as you can see, in the inner part, at low radii, the scatter are very large, because we know there are AGN in the center, cooling, feedback, all these produce quite diversity of profile. 
We also know that in the outskirts, so outside R500 or a few times R500, of course the cluster is not in virial equilibrium anymore. It interacts with the filamentary large scale structure. There is accretion on clumps and so on. But in the central part, the part we can resolve with erosita and we can study, in fact, the thermodynamical quantities here, for example, in red, you see density and um, entropy in black are quite well behaved. They have relatively low scatter. So we think we can then use this to inform our understanding of clusters as cosmological probes. So we have done a lot of simulation work to verify that we can achieve our goals. And this uh, shows the expectation of how we will be able eventually to place our detected clusters in red or AGN in blue into the large scale structure. This is an embody a series of embody simulation led by Jean Comparat. The paper is out and you can read it, it's very nice. And then on top of that, we paint with abundance matching galaxies in AGN using all we know about AGN luminosity function evolution and cluster mass function evolution. And then we can simulate with detailed instrumental simulations how Erosito will see a chunk of the sky generated by these and body simulations. And then we can use that to verify our data flow, verify our software, and of course, verify our predictions. So all in all, uh, we think we have built a powerful machine, but of course, as always, when you do an old sky survey, there is very large legacy power beyond these main goals, main cosmological goals. And uh, uh, as I will tell you in a minute, the, 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 we are gonna detect millions of point sources in the extragalactic sky, mainly AGN. But of course, we are gonna survey at the same time the Milky Way and study the population of compact objects in the Milky Way but also of stars, young, magnetically active, fastly rotating stars, coronal emission, that will be very useful to do population synthesis of the stellar population of the Milky Way. And then our ability to resolve and, and spectrally study the diffuse X-ray emission, the hot gas in the ISM of the Milky Way is unprecedented. And on top of that, our scanning strategy is very nice uh, to detect variable sources. We are keep going over the same parts of the sky on hours, uh, days, and months time scale. And so we have a large uh, expectation to detect transient of different sorts, including tidal disruption events. And also we hope to find many things we were not expecting, like serendipities that you will hear. So now I'm back to where I started. So I can tell you not what we were dreaming to achieve, but actually what we have been doing since July. So this is a picture of the uh, uh, profile of the first day, hours after launch from uh, an ICE web, a Russian space web from Anatoly Zak, that shows the first injection into this parking orbit. And then after, one, well, after 19 minutes, when, the, when we were again above uh, the Kazakh Steppe, uh, there was the uh, firing of the block DM that put uh, SRG into this Earth escape orbit. Everything worked beautifully and perfectly. The, the, uh, both the proton and the upper stage deliver exactly the orbit we were expecting. And this is a plot of how the orbits look like, uh, updated as of uh, April 22. K1, K2, and K3 are three orbit correction maneuver that were needed in order to go from this uh, uh, super eccentric orbit away from the Earth into this large halo orbit around L2. And essentially we consider in section into this orbit the time of the K3 correction maneuver that was done in October 21st, as you can see here. So last April 16, we have completed our first circle around L2, okay? And we are now uh, moving along this predicted trajectory. So this is a few uh, milestones along the way. Of course, while we were moving towards L2, uh, we opened our uh, cover. We let uh, degassing the uh, cameras and mirrors to degas. So before we cool down, we wanted to avoid any residual dust or molecules to be around so that otherwise they would stick on the, onto the cold surface of the CCD. And then we start switching on CCDs in late August, and it took about two months to commission all the cameras with some hiccups that I will tell you in a minute. And so in only mid-October, with one month delay, we started our scientific observations. And in December 13, we started the OSCAI survey. 
So operations of SIG are quite a complicated business. The mission control center is in Moscow and operated by NPO Lavochkin with a lot of support from ICI, the Russian Space uh, Institute. But we at MPE, we have the responsibility to actually issue the commands for Hirosita through our Russian colleagues. So it requires quite a good teamwork between the German and the Russian team that has been doing, has been going on really very well since we started. This is a picture of the empty control room at MPE. I mean, in this moment right now, we, I see from, from the window in this room, I see the uh, operation room. There is one person now. Usually we have two operators, but due to coronavirus restriction, we cannot do that anymore. So since uh, March, in fact, we have been operating mostly from home. And this is a gallery of the uh, people that are doing their service for operating Erosita. They have one daily contact, about four or five hours. They issue commands, they check the health of the instrument, and they work very closely via speakerphone and internet with their Russian colleagues in Moscow to make sure that everything works fine. So a few other characteristics of the way mission operates. I told you we get the data from 24 hours once per day. So these data are telemetry down, and immediately we start uh, so-called near real-time process analysis. Uh, this has been developed mainly from uh, Jorn Wilms group in Bamberg, and this allows us, of course, to do a basic check of the health uh, of the instrument, and uh, there is a very uh, fancy uh, user interface to which operators can plot every other housekeeping parameters against anything else. And it's very useful for us to understand what's going on. But on top of that, this allows very quick check for transients and new sources. So within minutes from telemetry arrival, we are able to alert right now internally if something weird or something interesting was found in the last 24 hours. In the same time, of course, the data go through uh, standard processing that allow a much deeper uh, projection of the data studying uh, and essentially download uh, creating uh, images, uh, well calibrated images uh, onto which we do detailed source detection. And this is also allows you with more delay of, of a few days to compare your sources with what you know you previously scanned over or what you know Swift Chandra XMM have been observed and this all together allow us to generate many alerts for transient sources. Right now, we are still operating into, uh, you know, uh, learning mode. We are distributing these alerts only internally. The vetting process is done by hand, but we hope in about one six months to one year time scale to move to a more automatic uh, transient vetting process, and we, we will be able to search on variability from a wide range of time scales. So I told you there were a few hiccups in our operations. Uh, the first one, uh, and maybe this was in the public domain since people know about that. So the reason why it took us one more month than expected to commission the cameras is that we start encountering uh, issue in which some camera would not behave. Maybe corrupt data were generated, corrupt images were generated. And these were clearly associated to specific event in time in which one camera independent from the other six would start malfunctioning. We still don't know 100% what's the reason for that but i think by and large the expert people the instrument team and the operation team believes this has to do with interaction with very heavily very energetic cosmic rays that interact with our fpgas the camera electronics we have are quite sophisticated they have computers process process boards that allow us to screen the data before their telemetry down to remove cosmic rays and and do a number of uh, compression and so Unfortunately, FPGA with, with onboard processing cannot be made completely triple redundant. So it may happen that when, when a cosmic ray hits some part of it, some flips, some bits flip, and this may send the camera into a, a sort of unwanted or, or crazy behavior, if you want. Um, and we have had about 20s of this event. But nonetheless, what we can do, we can just reset the camera. So the cameras don't suffer damage at least so far none of the event we had caused any damage to the camera it caused some partially loss of data because of course the time it takes to find out there is a problem and to reset the camera sometimes a few hours sometimes it can be as long as 24 hours but nonetheless despite this fact here you see in, in color coded for each of the seven telescope modules how much what's the fraction of 
good time, so-called good time interval, and you can see everything is almost everything is almost blue everywhere, apart from few cases. The most dramatic one was this February 12 event in which our onboard computer that controls all the camera itself hang, probably due, another, due to another particle hit. And then that means we had to switch everything off and we lost about two days of data then. But that's almost all. Altogether, I think we are operating at about 95, 96% efficiency since the start of the OSCAI survey. The other problem we have is some uh, light leak. So we, we apparently, I think we have sunlight coming in into the camera case. We still don't know exactly from where. And this would not be a problem. For five out of seven cameras, this is not a problem because there is a filter on top of the chip that, of course, uh, filters out this very low, it's essentially UV or far UV light coming from the sun. But two cameras don't have the on-chip filter, camera number five and seven. We were hoping to use an hopefully we will be able to use this to study the softest part of the X-ray spectrum, you know, 100 EV. I think it would be a unique feature, but unfortunately these two cameras, as you can see, depending on the orientation of the spacecraft with respect to the sun, this is this ondulation that you see in these two plots, you see an increase in the count rate here, which is due to this uh, sunlight illumination. Of course, we can remove that simply by discarding the very, you know, very low energy photons between 150 to 100 EV. But this still mess up the energy resolution and the uh, gain of the camera. So the calibration of these two cameras is still ongoing. It's gonna be a bit more complicated. But let's say for broadband imaging, this is not a big problem. I was talking about calibration, a few important points. I think here I'm focusing on two. One is our bore psyche and, and you know, image uh, pointing uh, stability and, and uh, uh, positional accuracy reconstruction. As I told you, the spacecraft deliver fantastic pointing stability to much better than, to better than one arc second. I remind, remind you that our pixel size is about nine arc seconds. So this is one arc second. Uh, Hattian reconstruction is really great. And by now we have sufficient statistics from the survey and the experiment we have done that we can, for example, take the bright X-ray sources, correlate them with Gaia bright uh, quasars and bright stars, and we can correct the tiny, the smallest uh, uh, residual uh, misalignment within the telescope. And I think now we think we can uh, reconstruct position of point sources to, I think of the order of four arc second, maybe four to five if you want to be conservative. This is a one sigma number. And then the other characteristic is the energy resolution. And this is again, uh, numbers from this table, compare the energy resolution of the Rosita CCD with the XMM once and Chandra. And so we are, we are substantially better, especially at around one KV where most of our effective area are, is then both uh, instruments. And I wanna stress there is a joint German Russian working group uh, that contains both uh, members of the Rosita team, both in Germany and Russia that is hard working on, on iron, ironing out all the details of the calibration. Another aspect I'm sure everybody would want to know is what is the back, how does the background look like in L2? It is, it is the first X-ray telescope operating in L2. So this, maybe it's a bit busy slide, uh, the plot, the big plot on the left shows the full background. The blue curve is actually the total measured background during the survey, collecting all the photons from all the cameras and this is in counts per second per kilo electron volt per arc minute. So it's per arc minute uh, unit surface for one telescope. The green, line, the green curve is what uh, the particle background that you can measure if we close the filter. We have a filter wheel in front of our camera. We can expose them to the sky, but we can close the filter and use that as a sort of you know, uh, background measure. And uh, the, red, uh, the red and the black curves represent the uh, vignetted in black and the unvignetted background that you can reconstruct from the blue curve uh, by no knowledge of how the profile of your vignetting curve look like. So I think we are getting almost there. The red curve is almost on top of the green one. The main point is that uh, the darker green line is the prediction of the amount of particle background we were quoting in our white book uh, eight years ago. And so in L2, the background is about a factor of three higher than that prediction which of course affects our sensitivity, at, uh, especially above 2 kV. Below 2 kV, we are essentially dominated by galactic foreground and the cosmic X-ray background, which is this black curve here. But above 2 kV, we are dominated by particles, and this 
a higher background will have an effect on that. However, this background is very stable. It's much less variable than XMM and Chandra. Here you see one example, which is the uh, particle background uh, uh, flux distribution between counts between one and nine kV. It has an excess variance of about 6% only. Of course, particle background is not the only background. There are also uh, soft proton flares, but they also seem to be almost absent. And here it's one example of an observation that we did simultaneously with XMM of a famous AGN, 1H0707. Forget about the points. The, the source is very valuable and very interesting. The lines that you see in this plot, the top plot is Erosita, the bottom is uh, XMMPN, so the central XMMPN and the bottom XMM MOS. The thin lines, black, blue, and orange, are the backgrounds of Erosita in three energy bands. And you see it's very flat, while the XMM at the same time, this is simultaneous, the XMM background was varying very, very wide. So we have a rightly high background, but we think at, the, at least so far has been very stable, which of course helps a lot. So, okay, I think now I've told you what I wanted to the state of the uh, hardware and the mission. And let me now, I think, uh, how much do I have? 15 minutes, I can tell you, you know, 15 minutes of pretty pictures. Okay, that's the first slide images. You might have seen that before. These are seven uh, image of the uh, area of the Large Magellanic Cloud centered on the Supernova 97A. The Supernova 97A is a bright source at the center, is unresolved by us. Each of them is uh, produced by a different camera. You may see, if you have good eyes, that the cameras have not the same orientation in the sky. And this, of course, is done on purpose so that when we scan, we don't have always the readout in the same direction. Uh, and of course, we can combine them into this beautiful image. As I told you, it's a, almost circular, one degree field of view. There are many nice structures. This is color, false uh, colors in x-rays. I think on the previous slide, you can, okay. I don't have the colors, but it is between 0.2 and 4 kV. Uh, and here you can see various nice, uh, hot diffuse supernova remnants, uh, hot bubbles, and many foreground and background point AGN and stars. Uh, and here you see on the bottom left, this LMCX1 is actually a very, very bright X-ray source which lies just outside of the field of view so that we got uh, ghosts. These are actually single reflection. Essentially, this is stray light from uh, uh, LMCX1 that enters our images. And by comparison here, I'm showing the first light XMM Newton image that was also taken in the same field. Uh, it has similar spectral capability, uh, similar PSF, as I told you, but of course, what you would notice immediately is a much smaller field of view compared to Rosita. And uh, the central source is very bright and it's been long exposed. We took a spectrum. Uh, X-ray CCDs are really like IFUs, so you don't have just images, but you can take a spectrum for every pixel in your image if you have enough counts. For, for Supernova 97A in LMC, here you see a comparison with the Rosita spectrum in blue in, in cyan compared to the XMM one. And uh, here, of course, was very early days. This was back in September. We haven't even started our in-flight calibration, but the main point I want to show you, it's not about the calibration or not even the size of the error bar, but how sharp the lines are compared to XMM. This is what our improved spectral resolution will allow us to do, to study uh, bright, uh, soft X-ray sources to much better quality for CCD-like uh, um, instruments. So the other first light was a system of interacting clusters called ABEL 3391, 3395. Uh, it's really nearby, I don't remember how many megaparsec it is. But you know, this is a ROSAT image. I think this image is about four to five, five square degrees across. And that's the Rosat Old Sky Survey 0.5 to 2 kV image of the, you can clearly see, it's actually a, a, a triple interacting system. There is a Northern cluster and then a couple of Southern clusters. And XMM has studied that, but of course the XMM field of view is small. So you, you had to do separate pointings. I think these are three XMM pointings, one center on the Northern clump, one center on the Southern clusters and one in the middle to study the population of and, and the diffuse emission of the two clusters. But the advantage, as I told you, of Erosita is our ability to do raster scan. So we observe this source for about one day and a half uh, with this raster scan mode. And this is the X-ray image of the Erosita in the 0.222 kV band. So this is generally an X-ray image. It's not an optical image. And you see the clusters, of course. It has been slightly smoother, but 
essentially this is how it, the full band erosita sensitivity looks like with a plethora of background AGN, the three interacting clusters and the number of interesting clump extended sources, some of this as the same redshift of the cluster. So we are able with a large field of view to study not just this interacting system, but also the infalling groups and clumps. And Thomas Reiprich from Bonn uh, was the PI of this observation, he's leading a paper on that. And here again, the same image, just because it's so beautiful. On the left is a false color, but you, you, and you can appreciate the difference in the background AGN spectral properties. And on the right one is a, is a wavelet uh, um, uh, shape, uh, wavelet uh, filtered image where you emphasize the bridge between the two clusters, which is mainly due to outstripped gas. Uh, this is another nice image. Okay, probably you would have noticed this is not Erosita, but Peter Predel gave it to me. This is what the first color X-ray image ever taken. At least the first, this was the first color screen that MP, that MP had in 79. And they were using it to show one of the brightest supernova remnants near the Vela supernova remnants. This is Puppis A, the first X-ray, uh, soft X-ray color. Uh, and this is now the Rosita image of the same uh, supernova remnants in its full glory, image produced by Peter himself. Uh, again, between 0.2 and 2.2 kV. So we have used our calibration time to study clusters in detail because of course they are not variable. It's very, they are very good to uh, you know, calibrate our effective area and our vignetting. This is, you know, on the left, it's a boring, relaxed cluster on the right and interacting clusters. And we are now studying with the calibration group these systems. I show another couple of nice images of interacting cluster. On the left, there is Coma. Uh, PI of that is Eugene Churazo from Iki. It's from the Russian team. And on the left, Abel 3266, uh, Jeremy Sanders produced that image. And you clearly see, um, these are both uh, single band Rosita images. And you clearly see the amount of interaction and disturbance in the hot gas. And you appreciate a very large uh, in, uh, field of view of Rosita without chip clubs. So these beautiful images can be done. Of course, this is quite a deeply exposed uh, image. And then we spent the largest amount of time doing our performance verification to essentially to give us a preview of the, what the old sky survey will look like at the end of the program in four years time. Uh, we call it the equatorial uh, full equator uh, Rosita full equatorial depth because we went to the same depth that we was likely deeper than what we expect to reach with Rosita in the old sky survey in four years time over about just 140 square degrees. And this is the uh, exposure corrected image in the 0.522 kV band of this 140 square degrees. Uh, we detected in that image using the X-ray extent property alone about 450 clusters or at least 450 extended sources. As Rabulbul, our cluster working group chair is working on the a cluster catalog with our team here at MP. And we have uh, Matthias Klein and Joe Moore at LMU that have been using their uh, sophisticated uh, um, um, optical uh, uh, cluster finder machine to identify the counterparts of these clusters in the uh, dark energy camera uh, images. And so more than 340 have been cons confirmed up to redshift 1.1. And this shows actually the luminosity redshift plane, very preliminary, uh, uh, luminosity redshift distribution of the cluster within this 140 square degree patches. And you see we extend up to above redshift one. And we, here you see in black also object for which we can measure to some level of confidence temperature from the X-ray data layer. And now because we have chosen, of course, not by chance to do this survey in an area where excellent optical imaging, in particular the Subaru Upper Supreme Cam have surveyed the same part of the sky. So we can use the Subaru images to measure weak lensing masses for these clusters. And so this is again a very preliminary first image of how the mass now uh, determined from weak lensing on the y-axis versus redshift distribution of the uh, Erosita uh, detected clusters in the area. So Thanks to this lensing, we'll be able to calibrate our mass measurements uh, in this field and then use that for the old sky survey. And then this is an example of one of the largest clusters detected at redshift 0.4, just to show our ability in some extreme cases uh, to reconstruct the surface brightness profile with Rosita. So the horizontal black line is the background level. 
and that this is the fit to the measured uh, surface brightness profile in orange and then the model behind it. And we can then in this particular case, we have enough counts to do a spectral analysis and then therefore infer some property of the temperature of the infracluster medium from the survey data. And then again, the advantage of the large field of view, uh, we have detected a number of uh, large, you know, super clusters. This is a, an interesting one, a redshift point 35. Vittorio Girardini is working on that paper. Uh, and here you see on the left, the extended source detected by Rosita circled in red. On the right, this is the HSC density map, uh, those uh, redshifts. So with photo Z, we're consistent with that point 35. So we are detecting large scale filaments uh, over more than 20, 30, uh, around 30 megaparsecs with this data. But of course, this image is full of point sources. In fact, uh, we, I told you 450 clusters, but there are 25,000 point sources in this image. Uh, we did already have uh, a redshift from uh, Sloan and Gamma in the same part of the sky. One other reason why we choose them. We have already done some follow up uh, with Sloan 4 with spiders uh, that increase our redshift uh, um, availability for AGN. So we have already more than 6,000 spectroscopic redshift of the AGN sample. So this survey in itself, 25,000 is uh, just by number of detected objects, the largest contiguous X-ray surveys uh, ever, okay? That we were able to do in just three, four days of observation with Rosita. So this is some characteristic of the uh, X-ray to optical, and in red are all the Gaia sources which have significant proper motion. So we think we can separate AGN from stars quite well. And this is a plot of the redshift distribution from the spectroscopic redshift of this EFETS AGN in, in purple. And you see one high redshift object we detected blindly at an already known sources, but at redshift 5.8. But this is actually the first time that the redshift higher than 5.5 quasar were actually detected in a blind X-ray survey, not just followed up. And so I think we are uh, interested in looking more detail about the high redshift population from the X-ray selection. Julian Wolf and Mara Salvato are working on a sample of candidates high redshift. This gray uh, object are redshift, uh, redshift 4.5 or higher candidates. In some cases, we have very good photometry, like in this one I'm showing on the right. The photo Z is redshift 5.4 and it's quite robust. So we are hoping to get some more spectroscopy to confirm at least a few of them as genuine high redshift X-ray selected quasars. And then, we, of course, we have the stars. Uh, the Hamburg group, led by Jürgen Schmidt and Jan Robrade, is looking at the stellar population of EFETs. On the left, you see a preliminary HR diagram. So this is the Gaia color versus bolometric luminosity, color coded by the X-ray luminosity. So we are probing all different main sequence stars. Uh, and this on the right, is the X-ray to bolometric ratio as a function of, again, Gaia color, which uh, approximately tra tra track uh, spectra class. Uh, spectra class. And now this is where we stand with the old sky survey, okay? Um, or as uh, Joachim Trumper, that was the first one to do the uh, ROSA, to initiate the ROSA old sky survey, our ability to uh, exploit the unlimited field of view of Erosita in its survey mode. This plot on the center shows now uh, the actual image of the X-ray photons from Erosita in the most sensitive band between 0.6 and 2.3 kV band projected onto the sky, exposure corrected. Uh, Hermann Brunner and Chandra Maitra has been working hard on those images. I want to thank them. And uh, this is the status of the old sky survey as it was until I think uh, 10 days ago. So we have covered more than two thirds of the sky. Here you see the galactic plane with many interesting galactic sources. Here you see beautiful supernova remnants on the top right, another supernova, supernova remnant in the bottom right, and even more beautiful uh, dust scattering halo, you know, when you talk about serendipity. And on the exagalactic sky, of course, here we see clusters. This is Shapley supercluster. So this is again the image of the galactic plane. Galactic center is on the left. And now I'm going to give you a tour of the galactic plane, at least a quarter of the galactic plane in X-rays as scanned over by Rosita, uh, moving right from the galactic center towards the west. And here you see a number of very beautiful supernova remnants, diffuse emission, again the dust scattering halo now appearing. And this is the Eta Carina uh, nebula uh, here in the center of the image. 
So we are been now hard uh, working on the old sky survey and in the process, of course, we are exploiting our ability to detect transients. And this is just a gallery of a few published atels or circulars of discovery that we have made over the last four months. A few more are in the bag, including some tidal disruption event candidates. But this shows uh, just a few, uh, an unknown bright, very bright transient, a uh, few milligrams, I think, an after of a gamma ray burst on the right, and uh, a classical nova, uh, with very good spectral uh, information from Eurozit, and another bright transient associated with very faint optical counterparts. We still, we still don't know what it is, but it's probably an extragalactic uh, flash of, of some sort. So I'm really uh, close to uh, closing. This is where we stand with the old sky survey. As I told you, more than two thirds of the sky have been covered as of today with a relatively uniform exposure of 250 seconds. So this is about one tenth of the EFETS exposure, as I told you. We saw very few background flares because we have also a relatively flexible mission planning. We can, uh, in the case of emergency like this one that happened in February where we lost two days of data, we can reorient our scan so that we don't leave any gap in the sky. So, so far we are continuing scanning the sky without gaps. We have discovered numerous transients. As I, as I told you before, we are fine tuning our betting process. And we are, of course, working hard in trying to get follow-up resources, but unfortunately, due to corona, probably almost all ground-based observatories are now shut. So there is a limited amount of fast follow-up we can do from ground. We have detected more than 350 sources already, at least in the German hemisphere alone. So definitely, we are on course on, 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 on uh, producing catalog from the first sky survey that will supersede, in terms of sheer number of objects, the size of all collected catalogs that have been put together by all X-ray mission since the beginning of the history of X-ray astronomy so far in just a few months. We are working, as I said, on the follow-up. This is a view of the optical near-infrared survey sky. It's very complex. I don't want you to go into detail. We have organized, as you know, our scientific exploitation of it in two consortia. The Russian consortium has the East Galactic Hemisphere, the German consortium and the West Galactic Hemisphere, and each of us is discussing with partners throughout the world to exploit the Rosita data and their multi-wavelength properties. So if you want to work with the Rosita, you have to be aware that the Rosita is a PI instrument. All the data are reduced and calibrated in PE with, a, with its own pipeline. Um, then the scientific exploitation of the data is shared between the two partners, uh, the German one and the Russian one in this uh, east-west galactic coordinate I told you. For our German part of the sky, we are committed with our space agency to, to release the full data you know, down to the calibrated event files uh, periodically, and we are planning three releases uh, after a two years period, uh, proprietary period. In 2022, we released the ERAS-1, the first old sky survey, the image I showed you with all the catalogs and data. In 2024, we released the first four passes, and in 2026, we released the full four years worth of old sky survey data. Uh, if you want to work on the proprietary data, then you have to come to an agreement with either a German or Russian consortium, and you do that by discussing at the working group, uh, depending on your science interest and your, uh, you know, resources that you can bring. And we do have in Germany a number of in individual external collaborators, and we have already signed a number of MOU with large survey teams uh, throughout the world. They are listed here. So that's the final slide. Is the summary of where we stand. Um, I told you we launched successfully in July 13. All Sky Survey have begun after a couple of months of very interesting and exciting performance verification and calibration observation in mid-December. And everything so far indicates that uh, all the characteristic of the instrument as well were designed, almost all have been met. The image quality is superb. We have excellent spectral resolution. We are observing with high efficiency. And so our original prediction, I think, look good if uh, we continue on this track. We have some issue, of course. Uh, we have some uh, uh, light leak in two of the cameras that degrades our soft spectral resolution and, in general, uh, our uh, spectral energy calibration. Um, and small data loss due to unstable behavior of the electronics that we think we can cope with. And the background seems to be a bit higher than what predicted, but very stable. But this affects our ability to our sensitivity above 2 kV. 
and we have a data release policy in place, at least I'm speaking here for the German consortium. Actually, the PV Cal data, including if it's, we, we plan to release it after one year, and uh, after one year, we have the stable calibration. I think for us, it means early 2021. So in less than one year from now, you can start playing with the Rosita data. And then the survey, as I told you, will be released periodically in the 2022, 24, and 26. But then the mission is funded for uh, two and a half more years of pointed observation after the end of World Sky Survey. And this will be made, uh, there will be call made to the community. So I really wanna thank you and thank all the many collaborators that over the years have been uh, working on, on Rosita and in Germany and Russia. And I think I try to compile a big list with the help of Peter and others. I'm not sure I succeeded, but you know, um, that's uh, maybe just a part of all those that have worked on Rosita over the many years. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. I hope that everybody enjoyed the, the talk. Maybe you can also uh, make your camera, your video open. Yes. Uh, we are going to give you space for questions, as many as you uh, may have. We are trying to do something different compared to the last time. Uh, we would like you to pose uh, your questions. So what you do, you in the chat, uh, you tell me or let us know that you have a question, and then uh, we will try to um, give you the chance uh, to uh, pose your question by even a set. And while you are uh, thinking to uh, the question, maybe I can start uh, with, uh, with the first question, Andrea. So, Mara, uh, just yes. to be clear, you, you, people should write their question in the chat. No, the question, the people should say in the chat that they have the question. Okay. We don't need uh, to uh, know the question in advance. As it will be, we try to make the experience as natural as possible. It will be uh, in person rather than uh, on screen. And so people can uh, have directly the question uh, directed to you. So the first question uh, for, uh, for you will be um, about uh, the use uh, of the 2.5 years uh, uh, of point observation after the old sky survey is finished. A lot of people are asking whether it will make more sense to extend the old sky survey by additional two years and go deeper maybe in the harder band. Does it make any sense or you think that point observation are a better use of the USITA time? Well, I think we will have to see, first of all, how the old sky survey proceeds. Um, I personally think that we have just uh, scratched the surface of the potential of using Erosita in some creative way during the PV phase, especially this wide survey option of this raster scan, allowing you to go deeper, maybe not over the old sky, but over hundreds or even thousands of square degree. Probably, to me, seems the most attractive, but I think it's pretty early. We, we will have to see, and as I said, there will be ample time for the community to come up with good ideas for using it as it later. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question from uh, uh, Nico Capelluti, and maybe Nico, you can try to unmute yourself and pose your question directly. I don't manage to... Uh, find him to uh, unmute himself. Move to another question. Yeah, let me try to see if I manage to reach to it, because otherwise I have to read the, uh, the question. There are many hundred people connected, so it's difficult to go to, to the right uh, uh, point. But OK, let me, uh, so Nico is actually, um, Nico, you are unmute now. Oh, okay, hi, hi Andrea, hi Mara. Hello. Uh, my, my question is, what kind of data will be released in uh, in the various releases? As I saw, I think calibrated event files, catalogs, images. And how about the software? Will it be available? To sure. Release? Yes, of course. Yes. Thanks. So you can uh, mute yourself, and then the next question coming from uh, Kazuma Ishio. It is a bit slower in this way, but I think it is nice to give the persons the possibility to speak directly. Kazuma, you are uh, unmute now. You can uh, you can pause your ah uh, sorry now now it it is un unmuted. Uh, uh, you showed the 
uh, background level is very uh, stable uh, compared to the other telescopes. And then uh, you would like to know the reason. Ah, the reason. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, we, I, I, I don't know the reason. I mean, we, we are probing a, a completely different uh, environment in, in the LSV. I mean, no, no other uh, survey has done 12.2. Mm -hmm. So this may, okay. There are one possibility, of course, is we are at the bottom of the solar minimum. So some of the solar induced uh, flaring events right now, they are not there. But then, you know, the the whole point of for us to discover was that um, uh, no other mission had, had uh, particle background monitors at those energies before. So we didn't know. And we are actually learning about that as we speak there. And so I'm not really an expert of the um, solar magnetosphere to answer that question. Uh -huh. So maybe the location, maybe the energy band. Uh, so the uh, reason is not unclear yet. Well, the energy band of it is not new, but it, mm -hmm. it's uh, the, uh, I think it's the, the location and the solar cycle for sure mm -hmm. uh, are among the main reasons, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my canon question, you are uh, uh, on mute. You can, uh, you can speak now. Yes. Uh, I would like to know uh, what is the lower limit for uh, telemeter pulse height? And is it the same for all cameras? Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, it may be about 80 EV. But we, I think we start, uh, we consider uh, well, I think we basically ignore everything below 150 EV. Okay, but, but you actually are storing the data for down to 80 EV? Yes, I think so. I don't know whether someone can have a more precise number on the chat, if or Conrad or Peter, but yes, I mean, of course, at some point it's a compromise because we start dominated by, by, by the detector noise, and then this will saturate our telemetry. Um, yes. Uh, can someone tell a more precise number of what we telemetered down? You can try to. Well, maybe I, I'll I'll um, I'll look into that, but that's my recollection. Okay, we have a, a question from uh, Gunther Asinger. Uh, Gunther, I don't see you on the list of participants, so I cannot unmute. I fear to unmute yourself. I think I can do that. But you see him. Uh, OK. I, I'm unmuted now. Thank you very much. I yes. first would like to, to thank you uh, for a wonderful colloquium. And it's really amazing how many people all around the world are connected. Um, it's, it's truly wonderful. I, I have a short question. And that is, uh, do we already know about the cross calibration between Erosita and XMM on one hand, and then maybe also uh, between Erosita and Art X, uh, T, XC. Sorry. And um, well, I think we don't have a definitive answer. Of course, we have looked into that. Um, the what we are looking at right now is mainly, as far as I am aware. I mean, mainly we are looking at these clusters, okay? And um, it appears that um, we tend to measure slightly lower temperature than XMM does. Of course, but uh, this would be expected if there are some multi-temperature structures and we have a very softer, much softer response. So I think we are still trying to understand whether there are still residual calibration, cross calibration issue, or is just due to the fact that we have a different response and the, the gas is generally multi-phase. And I think we are actually gonna learn something about the clusters in this way. Um, about the cross calibration between XM, Arctic C and Erosita, this is actual uh, work that is started now. We are starting uh, some sort of regular Arctic C Erosita uh, exchange uh, collaboration. I think basically until now, the both teams have been super busy with their own instruments and we have had very little chance. 
at least of course here in Germany. Uh, probably someone, if there is some Russian colleagues online, maybe they can tell us something more, but we are now opening up some also German-Russian collaboration to, to uh, so that each of us understand the relative cross calibration, the calibration of the two instruments. But again, I'm, I don't really have much more to tell you now. There was a, a question from uh, uh, Valentin Ivanov that I don't think is uh, online anymore, but he was asking uh, what determines the lifetime of the mission? Right now it's funding. So we don't really have consumables. We all our cooling system is a passive cooling system. And uh, we have had, I think, the orbit insertion, the launch was so good that as far as I understand from the ballistic experts, in principle, we have fuel that is needed to keep us on the L2 orbit with successful small correction maneuvers for, I'm sure, more than 10, 15 years. But right now the mission is funded for maybe six and a half, as I said, for, or maybe seven. So two and a half after the end of the Oscar mission. And, and I cannot tell you exactly what will happen in that respect in five years time. There is uh, another question from uh, Priyam. You are uh, unmuted now, so you Priyam, can ask yes. a question. Priya. Yeah, Priya, but it, uh, I unmute, but I don't manage to. I think I am now unmuted. Uh, hi, yeah. hello everyone. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much for a great colloquium and congratulations to the team. So I was curious, have we detected any new clusters? Oh. In the that you showed, what fraction are hitherto unknown clusters? Oof, uh, very large fraction. I, I mean, in this EFETS field, there was no X-ray coverage of that depth over 140 square degree this 450 okay maybe there could there, there might have been some optical search but probably the ones i know were done after Vivozita. so these 450 x-ray clusters i would say 90 percent are new this is only 140 square degree so as of today we were discussing the old sky survey internal preliminary catalog contains uh few thousands of clusters i would say 90 percent are new Wow. Yeah, of course, I mean, we, we are going much more sensitive than Rosa, so at least in terms of X-ray detection of clusters, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, I have uh, checked on all the, uh, no, there is a uh, Alex actually uh, question. Give me a second. If I, maybe Thomas can help me to unmute Alex. Alex knows who he is. I don't know who he is. I am trying to unmute him. Oh, he says his mic doesn't work. So I can read the question myself. Oh, yeah, please, yes, sir. Is there an explanation about three times higher particle background? Alex, oh, hi, Alex. Hi, uh, explanation of three times higher particle background. What is within the uncertainty of the predictions? Yes. So I think if you remember, you, you may, because you were here working on that with us, uh, Rashid and others before, I think what we always wrote and said was our, our estimate of the expected background was always worth within a factor of a few, okay? Was, and uh, what we are looking at into now, Michael Freiberg and Tanya Erhards are doing that, we are building a much more detailed model of the instrument. Okay, that you need in order to understand how the instrument interacts with the cosmic rays. And so part of the discrepancy with our original prediction was due to the fact that the model instrument was not accurate enough in all the details of what is actually being built with all the screws and details. Okay? So I think this accounts for part of it. The other thing is that the particle background from cosmic rays essentially anti-correlates with the solar cycle. When the solar cycle is at the minimum, you know, you have less, I don't know whether this is actually physically accurate the way I'm seeing, but you know, there is less push away effect from the solar wind itself. And so we are more exposed to the cosmic, if you want to say cosmic ray, or at least galactic cosmic ray background. And so I don't remember, I don't think we made the prediction for the most pessimistic case, if you want. So, but I think there is a big group, in fact, especially this is very important for Athena. So 
uh, Athena has a large group of people working on understanding the Rosita background, of course, also with the, in collaboration with the Rosita team. Okay, uh, there are more uh, uh, questions. There is one from Eric uh, Kulkers. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I was wondering if there are any people from the Russian team connected, and if so, can they tell us about the uh, the data release data release policy? Or can you? I cannot. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. No, okay, maybe one, one let me correct this. Um, the CalPV data uh, for both, that for programs that are both German and Russian led, we all agree that will be released after one year of a stable calibration. And so it is gonna be sometime uh, next year, this I know. But for the old sky survey, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> thanks. I have to ask the Russians then. Sure, yes. Simon, you want to say? Yeah, I had a question for variability studies of relatively bright sources. Is it true that there will in the end be six independent observations of every position on the sky for each of the eight annual surveys? So 40, 48 observations in total? Correct. That's for most of the sky. In fact, as I will show you, as I showed you on the, maybe I can show it, uh, you know, the, the great circles all intersect at the, at the ecliptic pole. So at the ecliptic poles, we actually have a data point every four hours for four years in this one square degree that we go over. But, you know, there is an area at the ecliptic pole where there are a few more points, but for most of the sky, what you said is correct. So six data points every four hours, and then again, another six after six months and so on. And you have this full spectral information too. So in principle, you can look for spectral variability. Indeed, yes. yes. This is, for example, one of the triggers we try to implement almost automatic to see whether there are uh, spectral variation of sources and trigger an alert to the interesting scientist. Thanks. There is a, another question from Gunther. Uh, yeah, Andrea, uh, you, I think it was mentioned on one of your slides, but he didn't say anything about the, yes. the, the nature of the lines in the background. There's an iron line and so yes. on. And what is, what do we know about that? Yes, probably not enough. So indeed, I think this is actually came out, out of a bit of a surprise. Uh, for those of you who have played with XMM data, uh, we wanted to avoid these very large uh, um, uh, fluorescence lines in the background that are due to the support instrument around it. So Erosita was built with a graded shield around the, the camera so to avoid to have that. But we still saw these lines in the, in the filter with close data. And I think people are, are I don't know whether Pedro or Michael are online, but it's probably due to some elements of, you know, screws, I'm talking about screws uh, of, the, of the, maybe the filter wheel or some parts uh, of the instrument that were not perfectly shielded. But I think we don't have a, an exact answer for that now. We are trying to model it as accurately as we can. I don't know whether Peter, or if he's online or wants to comment on that. Peter, you can speak. Okay, maybe this is a detail. Okay. Oh, yes. Um, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so the iron line is indeed a mystery because I think I do not believe in screws uh, because we have a graded shield inside the detector and that uh, shields everything which is there, though we don't know what it is. The aluminum line, Günther, what you have seen as well, probably, is due to the fact that the filter wheel was closed. And in the closed filter wheel, uh, I think the, the, uh, we cannot cover that. So the inside of the closed uh, uh, cover of the filter wheel is not shielded. This is this one, yes. But the iron yeah. line, we don't know. Yeah. Absolutely no idea. Yeah. Okay, there is a further question from Nicholas White. Uh, Yes, hi there. Uh, great. Congratulations to the entire team. It's fantastic mission and results. Yeah, I had a question about targets of opportunity. 
is there any capability to repoint uh, for a target of opportunity? I'm thinking in particular about LIGO, Virgo, gravitational wave events, whether you would be able to respond to those? So I think technical ability is there. Um, we actually, uh, we had an internal policy agreed by all teams that we are, we are trying, we don't advertise that and we are trying to put a very high bar for what will have to happen for us to interrupt the survey. Um, it's a bit vague, I, I admit, but um, uh, you have to also to consider that we have this uh, one window per day of contact with the spacecraft, so it's not something we can react, uh, 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 you know, on, on minus for our time scale. Everything you have to consider, we have typical reaction time of, of the order of 24 hours. But and in general, we don't. We will not want to use Erosita as a TOO machine in general, as long as you know XMM is still alive and healthy and swift. Um, but we will consider exceptional cases. Okay, thank you. There is still uh, one pending question from uh, Stulin. Yeah, hello, Andrea. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. I have one question um, about supernova randoms. Did Iwosita discover any younger random than the Kepler supernova random? I, I, I couldn't hear uh, you very well completely. You asked if we discover some new young supernova remnants? Um, yes. Well, I think it's a bit too early for me to answer this question. We, we haven't really started looking in the data at that level. And uh, I don't know whether, I mean, Werner Becker at MP is the one who is leading with his student, Martin, who is leading the work on the search of that. But, you know, this beautiful uh, All Sky Survey data I've shown you, we had to, I mean, it took us some time to, to, under, to, to get our pipeline to work and understand them. So I think for us, it's really the beginning. I'm pretty sure there will be some the new discoveries. We expect them to be, but right now we don't. Uh, I mean, I don't have you know a list uh, that I can tell you. There is a question from uh, Vanessa Moss. Vanessa. Hey, uh, greetings from Sydney. Uh, great talk. It's really nice to Hi, see Vanessa. all the progress. Hey, um, I was just asking because I, I I was wondering about the variability aspect too, and it's similar to Simon and Nick's question, but it's basically like. Obviously, if you guys have to stay on your track, other telescopes might be more flexible. So in terms of if we wanted to plan commensal observations and try to follow along, is the pointing plan public or will it be, or how, do you, how are you gonna handle that? Yes, uh, so the, um, we know every time where you see this pointing. In fact, there is a nice web page at Iki that you can go, this is the link, it's a public, you can and they tell you exactly where is this pointing right now and any moment in time, in the future, in the past. So we have, we have of course, similar tools uh, and we are discussing on a case-to-case -case basis with, with different observatories if they are interested in doing commensurate observation. One, of course, I think maybe you know that we discussed that, you know, Erosita is at L2 and we look 90 degrees away from the sun. Okay, so that means we typically scan the sky um, that is visible at dusk or dawn from, from Earth. Um, so we, we never look, you know, at the, what would be the zenith or midnight. Uh, um, but apart from that, of course, we know where Rosita is pointing at any time. And there have been discussion for trying to do some commensurate observation. At some point, I think one will have to do some experiment. Right now, we, we haven't done anything systematic. Okay, uh, Manu, question? We cannot hear. 